ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار In the previous lesson in the opening lesson of this explanation of the four principles we looked at the introduction of Sheikh Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab rahimahullahu ta'ala which contains a great and mighty supplication and the point at which we finished in the previous lesson was that we finished discussion the discussion of the aspect of mercy the aspect of rahma which is found in this opening supplication and that mercy ar rahma sheikh al islam muhammad bin abdul wahhab intended mercy to the one who would read his treaties or the one who would listen to his treaties and because rahma is required in everything in da'wa the teacher to the student the da'i to the mad'u the one who invites to the one who is being invited in commanding good in prohibiting evil in all of these affairs what we see is a manifestation of rahma of mercy and this itself is founded upon the fact that the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sent as a mercy to all of mankind wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin we do not send you except as mercy to all of the worlds well, uh, and likewise the saying of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bil mu'minina raufur rahim merciful compassionate to the believers these are traits of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so shaykh al islam muhammad bin abdul wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala he began his uh, opening treaties by making uh, the opening part of his treaties by making dua by making supplication and showing mercy to the the student the one who is listening and the one who is reading so we'll continue with the explanation of sheikh salih al sheikh and the point at which we finished in the previous lesson was that the sheikh mentioned how a person should be grateful to allah and fear allah at the same time in that if allah willed allah could have made him to be from the people of sin or from the people of misguidance and the fact that he is someone who is making da'wa to others and inviting others allah could have made him be in their position allah could have decreed that he is the one who is in their position the sinful disobedient one the astray misguided one and so this shows that a person has to recognize the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon him and likewise the point that was made that even the hudud even the prescribed punishments they are not a means of vengeance rather they are a mercy upon the individual because the goal behind it is to release and free that individual from captivity to iblis to shaitan and that this prescribed punishment is a way of showing mercy to him in that regard so this is where we finished in the previous lesson and continuing from this point onwards we move to the second half of this opening uh, introduction and this is the statement of sheikh al islam muhammad bin abdul wahhab rahimahu allah ta'ala wa in yaj'alaka mimman idha u'tiya shakar wa idha abtuliya sabr wa idha adhnaba istaghfar fa inna hadhihi athalath unwan as-sa'ada so the supplication that allah that he makes you from those who when they are given they are grateful and when they are tested they show patience and when they sin they seek forgiveness and indeed these three are the signs of happiness so the sheikh says that The statement of Sheikh Al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab idha u'tiya shakar 
إِذَا أُعْطِيَ شَكْرَ That when he is given, he is grateful. This is because this giving, this ata, this thing which is bestowed, is from Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah the Mighty Majestic, and it is a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning everything that comes to you, everything that is given to you, of wealth and possessions, and all the other various uh, things that come to you, this is all a favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah loves that His servant should be grateful for those favors. And this shukr, so whenever he receives, he is grateful. And this shukr occurs in two ways. It is by way of lisanul maqal, lisanul maqal, which means by way of the tongue of speech, meaning the actual physical tongue. And likewise it is bil amal, by way of one's actions. Then the Shaykh mentions numerous verses in the Quran. The first of them is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anishkur li wali walidayka. Anishkur li wali walidayka. That you be grateful to me and to your parents. In this ayah, this command to be grateful refers to both gratefulness in speech and likewise gratefulness by way of one's actions. And with respect to Dawood alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded, I'malu ala Dawood shukra. Work, O family of Dawood, in gratefulness. Here this ayah is specifically referring to shukr in terms of actions, in terms of deeds. And then in another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَاشْكُرُوا لِي وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ وَاشْكُرُوا لِي وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ Be grateful to me and do not be ungrateful. And this ayah here is again referring to both speech and action. Be grateful in speech, through your speech. Manifest gratefulness through your speech. And likewise be grateful by way of your action. So here now the Shaykh discusses a point about the difference between a shukr wal hamd. A shukr wal hamd. Shukr is gratefulness and al hamd is praise. What is the difference between the two? The Shaykh explains that a shukr, which is gratefulness, that this is always in relation to a ni'mah, to a favor. When you receive a favor, a bounty, an excellence from someone else, that is then met with shukr, meaning gratitude. As for alhamd, which we can translate as praise, then this may or may not be on account of a favor. Meaning that you, when you praise someone, you may be praising them on account of a favor received, or it may be in the absence of a favor received. Alhamd is not specifically tied to a favor unlike a shukr. Rather, alhamd can either be for a favor or it can be purely praise. Purely initiating praise, just beginning and commencing with praise with respect to some, someone else. So a shukr, a shukr, which is only in relation to a favor, then that can be in terms of speech, or it can be in terms of action. So someone gives you a favor, someone bestows a favor upon you, then you are grateful for that by way of your tongue. You express your gratitude. You express your gratitude. Or you could be grateful in terms of your actions. You do something in turn, in return, which is a way of showing your gratitude for the favor received. So therefore, a shukr is in relation to a favor, and it is by speech and by action. As for alhamd, it is only by way of the tongue, because alhamd is praise. So alhamd is only by way of the tongue, and that is the difference between a shukr and alhamd. Alhamd, can, it can be in return for a favor, you pray someone for a favor, or it is in the absence of a favor, it is just pure praise which you are commencing from yourself. And it is done only by way of the tongue as opposed to shukr, gratefulness which is in speech and in deed. So the shukr, gratefulness, 
when you receive either u'tiya shakar, this first quality, then this means, how is this done? There are two elements to this. The first is that you ascribe this ni'mah, this bestowal, to the one who gave it to you. So you ascribe the ni'mah to where it actually came from. And in this case, of course, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you acknowledge that it came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it originated from Him. And secondly, that you praise Him on account of this ni'mah. You praise Him. You praise Him for it. And you do not turn to others besides Him. وَمَا بِكُمْ مِن نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ Whatever favor you receive or you have, it is from Allah. It is from Allah. And likewise, يَعْرِفُونَ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ يُنْكِرُونَهَا Allah speaking about, some, about a group of people. They know of the favor of Allah. Meaning they acknowledge that it has come from Allah. Yet they reject it. Meaning that they ascribe it to other than Him. So the first angle is that you must acknowledge that the favor is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, for no, and, and no one else besides Him. And that you praise Him. You praise Him for, him, for it. Because He is, is, is the originator. And the second aspect and the second part of a shukr is as it relates to action. Because remember, shukr is in speech and in deed. So in speech it is clear. We praise Allah after having ascribed the ni'mah to Him. As from the action of uh, amal, of deed, of actions, then it is that you use the favor, you use the favor in whatever is pleasing and loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how you are grateful to Allah in terms of your deeds. So Allah bestows you with wealth, for example. You use that wealth only in those affairs that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Providing for your family, feeding your children, purchasing books uh, to remove ignorance from yourself in relation to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, giving charity, giving zakah, and whatever other things that are part and parcel of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only that, there are many other favors besides wealth. There is the favor of health, using that health in what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in His ibadah, in His worship, in, in, in voluntary fasting, in voluntary uh, worship, and in, in, in da'wah to Allah, and whatever other things involve the favors of health, and the faculties of speech, and hearing, and seeing, and all of the other favors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He, that he bestows upon you. So, this is the second part of being grateful to Allah, which is to use the ni'mah in whatever Allah loves and is pleased with, and not to use it in that which Allah is displeased with. Because this opposes shukr, this opposes gratitude. So this is what is loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in fact, the greatest of the affairs loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of the affairs of worship, is that a servant is that, that a servant manifests gratitude he shows gratefulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said in the Quran wa qalilun min ibadi ash-shakur that few of my servants are grateful look at this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informing us that there are very few from his creation, from his servants, who are actually grateful to him. Which shows that the status of being grateful, of, of being shakir, is from the loftiest of the stations of the religion, and is from the greatest of the affairs of worship. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about Nuh alayhi salam, ذُرِّيَّةَ مَنْ حَمَلْنَا مَعَ نُوحٍ إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا He's speaking about the offspring of those whom we carried with Nuh, meaning on the ship, along with Nuh. And indeed he, meaning Nuh, was a grateful servant. إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا He was a grateful servant. And this means 
that O oh, oh you people who are the offspring of those whom we carried alongside Nuh alayhi salam. And so we are the offspring. Everyone after Nuh alayhi salam, they are, they are the offspring of those who are carried alongside Nuh alayhi salam. Allah is informing us that indeed Nuh was a grateful servant. He was frequent and oft in being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, the Mufassirun, the people of Tafsir, they explain with respect to this ayah, they say that whenever Nuh alayhi salam used to eat, he would be grateful to Allah for it. He would show gratefulness and speak gratefulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is his food. And whenever he would have a drink, he would be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that drink. And whenever he would clothe himself, whenever he, he received clothing or made some clothing or acquired some clothing, he would be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. Which means, what does this mean? It means that in relation to his food, in relation to his drink, in relation to his clothing, he is freeing himself and everybody else from having any power or control in those affairs, meaning in food, in drink, in clothing. Rather, what he what he is what he is uh, when Nuh Ali Salam is being grateful in all of these things, he's essentially saying that it is only Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala who has the power, has the power, has the hawl, has the again the power uh, in relation to all of these favors which are coming to him the favors of food and drink and clothing and so on and so forth. So by being grateful to Allah in each and every single instance, you are acknowledging that the power, the quwa, the hawl, is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is from no one else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when we think of it in this way, it shows the connection between a shukr and a tawheed the connection between a shukr and a tawheed and this is from the amazing insight it is as if shaykh al islam muhammad bin abdul wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala when he began his opening uh, the introduction and he began with this supplication and he said may allah make you wa an yaj'alaka mimman idha u'tiya shakar then it is his understanding that shukr is connected to tawheed. And this is because when Shaykh al-Islam mentioned these three things, gratefulness when one receives, patience when one is tried, and seeking forgiveness when one sins, then it is as if Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, he is looking at the state and the condition of the muwahid, the muwahid, the monotheist, when he wrote these words and these three qualities, he's looking at the condition, the state, the way of being of a muwahid. That a muwahid is in between these three affairs. Grateful for favors, patient in calamities, and seeks forgiveness when he sins. And so Shaykh Islam is speaking to the reader or to the listener of his treaties in the sense that the muwahid is the one who has received the greatest possible favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no other favor that equals the favor of tawheed upon a servant. That a person is upon the correct, authentic Islam, al-Islam as-Sahih, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him to be upon a tawheed al-Khalis, pure tawheed. Worshipping only Allah alone. And this Tawheed on the basis of which Allah has promised happiness in this life and the next. So it is as if Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala when he began with these three supplications he is looking at the hal, the condition of the muwahid and reminding him of these things and conveying the connection between Tawheed and Shukr. Tawheed and Shukr. As for the second issue, وَإِذَا بْتُلِيَ sabar, وَإِذَا بْتُلِيَ sabar, 
that Allah makes you to be from those who when he is tested and tried, he shows patience. This is because the muwahid, this is because the muwahid, it is absolutely inevitable. There is no escape for the muwahid from being put to trial because of the nature of what he is upon. That which is upon of Tawheed in belief and speech and action and proclaiming this Tawheed and calling to it, it is inevitable that he will face trials and calamities and difficulties. So therefore, Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, recognizing that this is also the state of the Muwahid, he made the second supplication, which is, وَإِذَا بْتُلِيَ sabar, That when the servant is put to trial, that he shows patience. This is dua from Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab for the one who is reading his treatise or listening to his treatise. And this patience, a sabr is again in terms of the speech that is directed towards you. So you have to show patience to speech which comes to you and is directed towards you, harmful speech. Speech which causes you stress, anxiety, hardship, Concern in the mind, and so on and so forth. So speech which is which comes to you, or it is in relation to trials in your body that are put to your body, the physical trials, the hardships of worship, even physical harm from others. This is the hardship of the body, and likewise it can also be in terms of wealth and other such things. In all of these affairs, speech which is directed towards you your physical body, the wealth that you own, there will be trials that will come to you on account of being upon Tawheed and being a Muwahid. And so recognizing this and knowing this, that this is the state and condition of the Muwahid, Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, the second dua that he made, وَأَنْ يَجْعَلَكَ مِمَّنْ إِذَا أُعْطِيَ شَكَرْ وَإِذَا بْتُلِيَ صَبَرْ When he's put to trial, that he shows patience. And then the third supplication, وَإِذَا أَذْنَبَ اسْتَغْفَرْ When he commits a sin, he seeks forgiveness. This is because the muwahid, it is also inevitable, it is also inevitable that he will have something of shortcoming. He will turn away, away in instances from, from obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is inevitable that he will fall into sin. Either he will fall into minor sins, or he will fall into major sins. It is inevitable. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his names is Al-Ghafoor, the one who forgives. And so because he is Al-Ghafoor, because it is from the names and attributes of Allah that he is Al-Ghafoor, and that he is Dhu Al-Maghfira, the one who forgives, then the manifestation of that must be displayed towards his creation, which means that his creation must sin. They will inevitably sin. And this is by virtue of Allah being Al-Ghafoor, Al-Ghaffar, the one who forgives and the, the one who repeatedly forgives. This means that his, the, the, it is inevitable that his creation must sin so that he can forgive them and show mercy to them. And so therefore we see that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He loves from His servant who is the muwahid, who is the pure, the mukhlis, muwahid, who is sincere to Allah, who worships Him alone, that He is constantly seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we find that a servant that he doesn't seek forgiveness often and frequently, then he will inherit kibr. He will become full of pride. And this pride is something that will harm a great deal of his righteous deeds. Meaning that because this is a... Uh, Allah's forgiveness necessitates that, uh, that, that the creation are going to be sinful then it is from the qualities of a muwahid that he is constantly seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this prevents him from inheriting kibr. 
inheriting pride. That's why Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, he mentioned all of these three things together, وَإِذَا أَذْنَبَ stalfar. وَإِذَا أَذْنَبَ وَإِذَا أَذْنَبَ stalfar. When he commits a sin, he seeks forgiveness, and then he said after that, وَهَاُولَا إِفْثَلَاثِ أُنْوَانُ السَّعَادَةِ That these three are the signs of happiness. This means that these three traits and qualities are such that they are always with a muwahid. In every state amongst his states, the muwahid is grateful, he is patient, and he is seeking forgiveness. And so every time the servant increases in the knowledge of his Lord, then you will find that these three qualities increase in him. They become stronger. And every time Tawheed becomes stronger in his heart, then these three qualities likewise, they become stronger. And as a servant increases in his ilm, and he increases therefore in these three qualities, and they become stronger and stronger and more deeply rooted, then eventually he will reach the situation that these qualities will be such that they force him to not see anything except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only thing he sees who is deserving of his actions and the deeds that he performs is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that as he increases in knowledge, then he, he increases in these three qualities, these three traits. And as he increases in these three qualities, of being grateful, of having patience, and of making istighfar, then this will force him and cause him not to see anything but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning, nothing motivates him. His deeds are not done for anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He only sees Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He only recognizes his favors as coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he only sees Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These, this is the consequence, and this is where these great qualities lead a servant. They make him a greater servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they strengthen his ubudiyah, his servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to say, he used to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a day and a night more than a hundred times. More than a hundred times. As we see, as authentically narrated, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Kana Yastaghfirullah fil Majlis al Wahid Sabina Marra that in a single sitting he would seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seventy times. Seventy times he would seek forgiveness in a single sitting. This is the extent of the gratefulness of the Messenger of Allah Wasallam, And this is alongside the fact, all of the trials and tribulations that he went through, he showed patience in all of that. And he was constant in forgiveness. He was grateful by way of the ibadah, praying at night, being determined in ibadah. This is shukr. And he was patient in all of the trials, in the speech that was directed towards him, in the physical harm to his body, likewise in the wealth that he, that was used to, uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise he sought forgiveness 70 times in a single, in a single sitting. And what does this all of us, what does, what does all of this inform us? What does it teach us? It teaches us that we should not, that we are always in a great danger. The muwahid is always in grave danger. This is because he can become deceived. He can be deceived by thinking that he is from the people of Tawheed. And that he is someone who has actualized Tawheed, and he is now following the Salaf, and that he is the one who has come to know this knowledge, he's come to understand this knowledge. This is ghurur, this is a muwahid, 
is always subject to this type of deception where he is deceived, he deceives himself. He's made to deceive himself because he thinks, I know Tawheed. I've understood Tawheed. I know this knowledge. I am following the Salaf. I've actualized Tawheed. And yet alongside that, there is no khudur. There is no submission. There is no humility in his heart. And you find that these three qualities of being grateful to Allah, being patient upon his worship, meaning that in his worship, in, 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 in the ibadah, that you are grateful and that you are constantly seeking forgiveness, that we find that these traits are weak in him. These traits are extremely weak. Hardly being grateful to Allah for his food, for his drink. Hardly makes the supplications when he enters the house, when he commences his food, when he finishes his food, when he enters the, the washroom, when he leaves the washroom, when he wears a new garment, and so on and so forth. Even when he, the dua for having relations with his wife, the dua in every instance from the instances of life in which a person is remembering Allah, being grateful to him, ascribing these favors to Allah. All of this is a great danger that a person, he loses his humility, he loses his servitude, why? Because he thinks, I am a muwahid. I understand tawheed. I know that it is of three categories. I know what is shirk. This is all ilm. This is knowledge. This is just knowledge. This is not humility and servitude to Allah in and of itself. And that's why the muwahid is always in great danger of being deceived by the likes of these thoughts and becoming neglectful in his ibadah, in his, uh, in, in sabr upon ibadah, and sabr in, in patience away from disobedience, and being grateful to Allah, and seeking forgiveness for his sins. So, the wasila of tawheed, tawheed is a wasila, tawheed is a means to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is a great and mighty affair, it is not just mere knowledge, Rather, it is something that has with it certain traits and qualities. And those traits and qualities have been summarized here by Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abd Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah ta'ala, who in his insight, knowing that he is addressing and speaking to a muwahid, who would be reading his treaties or listening to his treaties, he made these three great and mighty supplications وَأَنْ يَجْعَلَكَ مِمَّنْ إِذَا أُعْطِيَ الشَّكَرْ وَإِذَا ابْتُلِيَ الصَّبَرْ وَإِذَا أَذْنَبَ اسْتَغْفَرْ فَإِنَّ هَذِهِ الثَّلَاثِ أُنْوَانُ السَّعَادَةِ So this brings us the end of the explanation of Sheikh Salih al-Sheikh and we move to a brief commentary by the esteemed Sheikh and the Allama Muhammad Aman al-Jami Rahimahullah Ta'ala. The Shaykh has only a brief comment, and inshallah Ta'ala we can conclude our lesson today with this brief comment. And so the Shaykh begins by saying, uh, he comments specifically on the, this particular supplication, وَإِنْ يَجْعَلَكَ مِمَّنْ إِذَا أُعْطِيَ شَكَرْ وَإِذَا أَبْتُلِيَ صَبَرْ وَإِذَا أَذْنَبَ اسْتَغْفَرْ فَإِنَّ هَذِهِ الثَّلَاثِ أُنْوَانُ السَّعَادَةِ So he comments upon this and he says that a man, a person, is put to trial by many different things. So he should show patience. A man has to show patience in the face of all of these things, many things that he's put to trial with. He should not despair. He should not fall into despair, but rather he should expect his reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِذَا أَذْنَبَ اسْتَغْفَرْ And when he sins, he asks forgiveness. The shaykh says, who is the one who does not commit a sin? فَمَنِ الَّذِي لَا يُذْنَبْ Who is the one who does not commit a sin? The sins are very many indeed. فَالذُّنُوبْ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْمُوبِقَاتِ وَالْكَبَائِرْ وَالصَّغَائِرْ وَمُحَقَّرَاتِ الذُّنُوبِ He says the sins are of many different types. There are four categories of sins. There are those which are the destructive sins. The مُوبِقَات these are the most grave and the serious sins like shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unlike magic, for example, 
These are the grave and serious sins which nullify a person's Islam. And likewise the kabair, the great serious major sins. And then there are the sagair, the minor sins. And then there are those which are the muhaqqarat al-dhunub, those which a person deems to be nothing. They are sins, but a person considers them to be absolutely nothing and he belittles them, even though they are, they, they, they can harm him. So, the Shaykh says, who is, you know, who is the one who is free from sin? Everybody falls into sin. And when a person perceives that he has fallen into a sin, he has disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning that his, his desires have overwhelmed him and overcame him in an instance, he disobeyed Allah, and then afterwards he realized, and then in that case he should hastily make istighfar, he should seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then the shaykh mentions the saying, the phrase, La kabira ma'al istighfar, La kabira ma'al istighfar, Wa la sagheera ma'al israr. This is, a phrase, this is a statement which is narrated by some of the sahaba from Ibn Abbas, Radiallahu an, anhuma, that alongside seeking forgiveness, the major sin does not remain. There is no major sin in the presence of forgiveness, meaning you seek forgiveness, there is no major sin left. And likewise, when you persist upon a minor sin, then it no longer remains a minor sin, it becomes a major sin, it turns into a major sin. The Shaykh says, whoever committed a major, uh, whoever committed a minor sin, and he did not seek forgiveness from Allah, and did not make tawbah, and then he persisted upon that minor sin, then that minor sin, that sagheera, becomes a kabira, it becomes a major sin. And likewise, if a person was to fall into a major sin, but he sought forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and when we say, he seeks forgiveness. When we say istighfar, that includes within it a tawbah. A tawbah. When we speak of al-istighfar, and when Shaykh al-Islam says here, وَإِذَا أَذْنَبَ استغفر, Meaning that when he commits a sin, he makes tawbah and seeks forgiveness. This is what is meant. So there is no kabira when a person makes tawbah. If a person repents from a sin, then his tawbah uh, is, 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 is acceptable to Allah as long as it meets the conditions and his sin disappears as long as he is truthful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it mean? It means number one, al-iqla' al-iqla' meaning al-iqla' and al dhamb You keep away, you immediately refrain from the sin. You stop doing that sin. Number two, al-nadam. Number two, you feel sorry that you fell into that sin. And number three, Al-Azam ala Allah Ya'ud That he is firmly determined that he should not return back to that sin. So when he brings together these three qualities and he asks Allah for forgiveness, he immediately stops the sin, he feels sorry for what he did, he resolves not to do it again, and he asks Allah for forgiveness, and he's truthful in that, then that will wipe out his tawbah. It will wipe out his tawbah. So tawbah wipes out the sin, meaning it erases it from the record. And as for al-istighfar, when you say astaghfirullah, then the meaning of this essentially is that you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to withhold the punishment upon the sin. When you say astaghfirullah, it is as if you are saying, Oh Allah, do not punish me with the punishment that is due for this sin. This is istighfar, as the scholars explain. And when you make tawbah, when you make tawbah, you refrain from the sin, you feel sorry, you resolve not to do it again, and you make, you know, you make the supplication of tawbah and so on and so forth, then this is something that actually erases the deed. So tawbah and al-istighfar are connected with each other. Likewise, when the sin is between him, and, and, and his Lord, meaning that only it is something that he commits and he harms himself. He follows his desires, he falls into shahwa, he follows his shahwa, he commits a sin. 
but no one, no one else is harmed, no one else's right is taken, then in that case he simply refrains from the sin, is remorseful for the sin, resolves not to do it again, asks Allah for forgiveness, then this will remove the sin. But as for when someone else's right is taken, he harms somebody, he reviles somebody uh, unjustly, he harmed them in their body, he harmed them in their wealth, or whatever else, he harmed somebody and took their right, then in that case he has to return that right to that individual, in order for his tawbah to be to be accepted, to be accept, to, 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 to be accepted. Uh, so he corrects and fulfills th- those rights which he violated of the people. And when this is done, then it is established that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will erase the sin of his servant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in many ayat, uh, uh, in many ayat in the Quran, and from them is his statement, وَإِنِّي لَغَفَّارُ وَإِنِّي لَغَفَّارٌ لِمَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا ثُمَّ اهْتَدَى Indeed, I am oft forgiving for the one who repented, then believed, then did righteous actions, then was guided, then he guided himself. So, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he forgives his servant, and that's why here the Shaykh Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Shaykh Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he said, فَإِنَّهَا أُولَاءِ الثَّلَاثِ أُنْوَانُ السَّعَادَةِ For indeed these three, they are the signs of happiness. So whomever Allah gives success in these three qualities, then indeed he has been granted success in every good in every other type of success. And with that is the end of the explanation of Sheikh Muhammad Aman al-Jami, rahimahullah ta'ala. And with that we will conclude our lesson here today. And in the next lesson, inshallah ta'ala, we will look at the explanations of Sheikh uh, Ahmed bin Yahya al-Najmi, rahimahullah ta'ala. And likewise we'll make a start with the explanation of Sheikh Muhammad bin Hadi al-Madkhali, والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين